You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. <laughs> history podcast that's not your history class, Pity Swords. Those little bits of history that don't quite fit in anywhere else. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Speaking of books, so I, I have too many, probably. Can you have too many? No. So I have a lot of books and I order lots of books, mainly for research, sometimes for fun, And so sometimes if I'm at work or if I'm away somewhere working, I will get my mum to open my mail for me. I'll be like, I'll pick up my mail, open it, it's fine. And I forgot that I had ordered a certain book and I'm on the phone to my mum like, ah, yeah, open it, open it, no worry, it's fine. Because normally we'll chat, she'll open it and then she'll be like, last laughs and epitaphs, really? What weird history is this? Don't you think you've got enough books on poison? Uh, this time, uh, there's a dead silence. Like, it's a very heavy silence. It's apparent it's there. To the point that I thought, has my phone cut out? Did I accidentally mute her? Did she accidentally mute herself? But no. Uh, she's like, oh really? This is the kind of book you want to read? And I'm thinking, fuck me, what book is this? What and I, and I couldn't remember what I'd ordered. I was like, because there's a few, and they're mainly about weird things in history and you know stuff like that. Probably one or two deaths. I was like, oh, is it one with a weird, like creepy death title? And it it was not. Well, it was, but it was actually Jeanette McCurdy's "I'm Glad My Mum Died." which my mother did not take too kindly to me purchasing. When I explained, you know, like some of the stuff in the book, I'm like, flick through the book, mum, pick a page, right? Pick a page, read it, and you'll get it. And then she was like, oh, okay, that's fine. But for a split second, my mother was not happy with me. But yeah, uh, so this week's episode, (laughs) bitty sword, I should say, is about the demon of the belfry. And I'm just going to quit my jibber-jabber and fact you. That's right, fact you I will. If that's okay. Uh, consent is key. So, William Henry Theodore Durant, he was born in Toronto, Canada in 1871 to William Durant and Isabella Hutchinson Durant. I mean, I hope it's Durant and not, like, Durant and I'm just terribly mispronouncing it, which I could be. It happens. He is the brother of Beulah Maud Durant, who is more so known as Maud Allen. That's her stage name and the name she kind of goes by for the rest of her life. So they had moved to San Francisco in California in the US when he was, he was still a kid actually. It was only in 1878. His dad had moved down there first and then he had set himself up and he was working there and then the rest of the family followed which was fairly normal for the time, fairly typical. So Theo, he grows up in San Francisco, he gets a really good education which is paid for by this wealthy dude who it is believed 
is Isabella's real father because Isabella was adopted so his mum was adopted but they think her father came from money so both him and his sister are very well taken care of because their dad's a shoemaker he's a cobbler or is he a shoemaker wait does he make shoes or does he fix shoes are they different anyway not the point somebody could tweet me tweet me and let me know so he gets this fucking fantastic education so good in fact that he studies medicine he's a medical student he wants to become a doctor of some kind i mean it is the 1800s so it's not as impressive as you think it should be you know who else was a doctor dr cream fucking gerbil man cosplaying as a human that motherfucker was a doctor so this young man has everything going for him like he is the straight white man where things are just going well he's 23 years old he's studying at cooper medical college in san francisco and he's also assisting at this sunday school for the emmanuel baptist church on 21st street so the younger members of the congregation you know like teenagers and like 20 year olds stuff like that they create this little society this little church society for like social purposes so like events and things and theo here theo durant he gets elected as the club secretary and he's also a member of the california signal corps so he seems to be a pretty good guy he helps out at the church he's the assistant superintendent at the sunday school so he teaches sunday school classes he helps out in the church and as we know straight-laced god-fearing folk who help out in their communities and project an image of you know goodness tend to be the worst fuckers of all but i digress so he was helping out at the sunday school everything is going well he is a respected pillar of the community and then something awful happens let's talk about blanche lamont blanche lamont was a 20 year old teacher from montana she had moved to san francisco after teaching in this like one room school in hecla so blanche had relocated from montana to san francisco and she was staying with her aunt and uncle the nobles her sister maud was also staying there now blanche had moved partially because she had health issues and the warmer weather was supposed to be better for her the climate was better for her overall health and montana's winters um they're not they're not the most fun one could argue i mean you'd freeze the balls off a brass monkey it's it's cold it's fucking cold so partially weather and partially so she could further her education definitely wasn't about furthering her social life because a social butterfly she was not she didn't really go places and if she did go somewhere like for fun she was usually with other relatives like she wouldn't independently go to a fun fair or whatever people did for fun in the 1890s so on the morning of april 3rd 1895 the notably kind and lovely miss blanche lamont leaves home in the morning see the course she was taking was being held at the boys high school you know i think it was the only place that was doing it so she did that and on the way she's with theo durant like they're on the uh trolley together so while blanche goes to the school theo heads to cooper medical college so later on in the day between like two and three she goes to a different school for cooking instruction because it's the 1890s and cooking classes were part of the typical schooling for women i say that as if home ec doesn't currently exist like it does but this was very much a necessary recommended thing at the time which is stupid men 
Learn to cook. Jesus Christ, I don't know, a lasagna, something easy. Not too complicated, it's just stacking. So, so at some point before her class finishes, Theodore Durant shows up outside the school and is waiting for her to leave. And when she does come out, she's with her friend Minnie Edwards. So he comes over and he starts chatting to Blanche and Minnie just carries on and she goes away and goes inside her, the streetcar she's going to go down. But she manages to clock Theo and Blanche taking seats on the dummy. And so do two other classmates. So she's still got her school books with her and she gets on, she sits down next to him and off they go. And as they journey on, it is noted that the young couple are acting very familiar with one another. They're leaning in close, they're whispering, he's tapping her back. It seems like they are maybe a thing. So there's this proper curtain twitcher. Keeping her ear to the ground, watching what's going on while peering through the lacy neck curtains. Which are basically just massive, massive doilies. Like somebody spent a good lock of time, like, crocheting that. But she's waiting for her daughter to come home, so she's peeking out through the doily. And she sees Theo, who she clearly fucking recognises because she goes to that church. I mean, it's the closest church. She can see it from her window. That's her church. She sees him open the side gate and let the young lady in. And that was the last time anyone saw Blanche Lamont alive. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else. Like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite player and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So later that day, around about 5 o'clock, George King, the church organist, he's in practicing. He's trying to get the keys all ready for his service. He, he doesn't want to let the congregation down, he wants to do well. So off he goes, and who comes down from the belfry other than Theo Durant? He doesn't have his jacket, he doesn't have his hat, and he's kind of pale and weird looking. So Theo explains to him that he was up near the roof trying to find a leak in the gas pipe, and he had been overcome with gas. Which I am assuming to mean that he inhaled gas, not that he passed gas. I mean, the two are not mutually exclusive. Both could have happened at the same time. But that's unlikely. So he's kind of weak and pale and all that stuff. So George, being like, shit, this isn't good. 
he runs off to the pharmacy and gets a bottle of Bromo Seltzer and comes back and gives Theo it to drink. So after he consumes his delicious bottle of Bromo Seltzer and he seems to be fine or at least no longer shitty, the organist asks Theodore to help him move this small organ down from the auditorium into the main hall. And Theodore's like, sure, I'll help. So off they go, and when they get upstairs, the organist noticed there's no gas smell. Like, there's no odour anywhere. And if there's no smell anywhere, why the fuck was this fella on the roof looking for a gas leak? And then he starts thinking, wait a minute, did we not get these gas fixtures fixed, like, fairly recently by a plumber? So that's a bit weird, but he keeps it to himself at the time. So they get everything moved down, it's fine, and then Theodore asks him to walk him home. Even though the two fellows live in completely opposite directions, he's claiming that he doesn't feel well and he still feels weak because of the gas, and if he could just walk him home because it'd make him feel better. And being the kind person he is, he does. Later that night, there's like a prayer service going on, and Mrs. Noble, Blanche's aunt, attends. And she goes looking there anyway because she expects Blanche to be there because she usually is. Theodore is sitting basically behind Mrs. Noble and he asks her if Blanche is there tonight. And when she tells him that no, she isn't there, he's like, oh, that's a shame because I have a book for her. So three days later, Mrs. Noble reports Blanche's disappearance to the police and the press. And later that evening, Theodore Durant shows up at her house with a book that he supposedly wanted to give to Blanche. And when he's there, he tells her auntie that he heard from another student that Blanche was neither dead nor missing, but in fact had joined a house of ill repute. She'd become a sex worker, basically. He'd gone there to hand this book in that he said was for Blanche, but then also said that Blanche had run away to become a sex worker. That math ain't math my friend. After this incredibly weird interaction, the police then interview Theodore Durant, and he tells them that he believes that Blanche Lamont has been kidnapped by white slavery groups and has been sold into prostitution. And they're like, yeah, that seems rational. Fair enough. Over the next couple of days, Theodore Durant does a couple of weird things. First, he's seen by the church janitor hanging out by the Oakland Ferry Landing. And when he asks him what he's doing there, he tells him that he's following clues about Blanche's disappearance. He also goes to a pawn shop and tries to pawn this ring. And the, the owner's like, nah, mate, nah. And then a package arrives at Mrs. Noble's house and it's three rings that belonged to Blanche that she was wearing the day she disappeared. And the package had the name George King on it, the organist who had walked Durant home that night. Nine days after Blanche's disappearance, it's Good Friday. So that would be the penultimate day of like penance really during Easter. Um, during Lent, I should say, and it's two days before Easter Sunday. So on Good Friday, you're supposed to abstain from meat. It's supposed to be like a very, a very stern day, somber day. The Young Society of the Emmanuel Baptist Church are having a wee meeting. Theodore Durant is the secretary of this wee society, and Minnie Flora Williams is supposed to be attending. The meeting was supposed to be held at the house of a church elder, a dentist named Vogel. Minnie had told her former employers, the Morgans, that she was thinking about attending this event, this meeting. See, she had been working for the Morgans and she'd been living in, but she was moving to like a new job at another side of the city. So her trunk had already been moved. And she said to them, well, I won't be back this evening because I'm thinking about going to this. This meeting for the younger church members it is supposed to start around about 7.30, half seven. 
And around about 7pm, Minnie and Theodore are seen having a heated discussion outside the church. Heated enough that many people take note. Someone thought it was maybe like a lover's tiff or something like that. But they were definitely... She was unhappy. And this very public argument was the very last time that Minnie Williams was seen alive. Now Theodore, he is the secretary for this group. And so he's supposed to be at this meeting pretty sharpish. But he doesn't show up until 9.30 that night. Two hours late. And when he does show up, he is dishevelled. Like, they use the term excited appearance. But we all know what that means. He was a mess. Now this Baptist church youth group event must have been really fucking exciting. Because it lasted another two hours. It had started at 7.30. So that's a four hour thing. 11.25 it finishes and near enough everybody goes home. They all go in their respective directions. Apart from Theodore Durant. Who heads to the church alone? The very next day is the Saturday before Easter. And a bunch of ladies have come in. They're going to decorate the church for Easter Sunday. They're going to make it fancy. They're going to fancy it up. And as they're cleaning and sprucing the place up, one of the women opens this cupboard door. And as she opens it, she is met with a horrific sight. I'm going to give you a wee trigger warning slash content warning for gore and essay. Okay. Inside this cupboard in the church's library was the mutilated body of Miss Minnie Flora Williams. She was half naked, her clothes had been torn, she had multiple stab wounds, her wrist had been slashed, her breast had been stabbed repeatedly, there was a knife still lodged in her chest. Her clothing had been ripped to the point that her underwear had been ripped off and was stuffed in her mouth and down her throat with such incredible force that they struggled to remove it. Once the women get over the shock of seeing this fucking horrible scene, they alert the police, who fucking hightail it down there. They come in, they look, they see the body, and they call in the big guns who head straight into San Francisco. So they start asking round, you know, doing some very basic, the bare minimum of detective work, and somebody goes, oh well, the last place I saw her was chatting to Theodore Durant. So they go searching for him. The first place they go, obviously, to his home. So they go in. He's not fucking there. Because he had already fucked off to the signal corpse. Like, he'd already gone. And so they decided to search his home. And in his coat pocket, they find Minnie Williams' coin purse. So at this point, the police split into two teams. Two fellows go to trail and hunt Durant and get him arrested. Which they do. And he's like, this is an outrageous accusation. I protest. So on and so forth. But they arrest him anyway. Well, the other team searches and investigates the church. And as they get up to the belfry, it's fucking boarded up. So they have to just break their way in. And as they smash through the belfry door, what do they find? None other than the naked corpse of Blanche Lamont. Her lifeless body was positioned the same way that medical students would position a corpse before dissecting it. With her arms crossed over her chest and a block of wood beneath her head. And surprise, surprise, the officers concluded that only someone with medical knowledge would have done this. After doing a wee bit more police work, they found her school books and her clothes, which were neatly folded, by the way, were carefully and neatly tucked into the rafters of the belfry. Okay, so I'm going to describe their deaths now. Uh, they're pretty gruesome. Trigger warning, content warning, essay. If you don't want to hear this, skip forward about 50 seconds. Okay, Theodore and Blanche entered the church, which just so happened to be empty, where he then strangled her to death. Once she was dead, he dragged her corpse up to the belfry, where he removed her clothes and then committed necrophilia 
with her corpse. He then tidied the place up, boarded the belfry door, and then went downstairs where he met the organist. Nearly two weeks after this event, Theodore lured Minnie Williams to the church, and once inside, he raped her, then killed her, and then mutilated her body. Unlike Blanche's body, which was neatly rearranged, he just shoved her body in a closet and didn't make any attempt to clean up the bloodstains. He just left, his whole plan being get the hell out of Dodge. He thought he could just walk away from it. So after he's arrested, these reports start coming in about Theodore Durant by young women who feared they would either not be believed or, if they were believed, that their families would take matter into their own hands and somebody would, you know, get the shit kicked out of them and or be dead. A couple women came forward and said that Durant had offered to give them private physical examinations at the church, which they politely declined. And one young woman reported that he had invited her into the library one day and when she arrived, he was buck naked. And she was so shocked and appalled at this situation that she screamed and ran the fuck away. Once this story hits the newsstands, it is effectively the crime of the century. You're going to hear that a lot in sort of historical crime cases. A lot of it is often the crime of the century. It's a massive fucking deal. And it is everywhere to the point that it takes one month to find a jury because everybody has an opinion. They go through 3,600 people to get a jury of 12. The trial lasts three weeks and the prosecution brings forth 50 witnesses. Like, that's just them. And the defense's argument is that Theodore Durant had no motive to kill these women because they had no money, he wasn't due to inherit anything, they hadn't, like, slandered him. Like, there was no reason. And it gets to the point where the judge goes, listen, if you're saying this is for a weird sexual urge, then yeah, that's motive enough for me. And so after a three-week trial, the jury deliberates for five minutes. That's not even enough time to get the paperwork done. And they find the defendant, William Henry Theodore Durant, guilty as fuck. And he is sentenced to a short drop and a sudden stop. And his lawyers, they mount appeals for like six fucking months until they've exhausted all avenues, all options, until there's nothing left. And then, on January 7th, 1898, Theodore Durant heads to the gallows in San Quentin prison. The warden starts to read the death warrant and Durant stops him, saying he will spare him this unpleasant duty. And then, he is executed hung from the neck until dead. His parents come to claim his body right away because they're worried about body snatchers or that somebody's going to do some fucking dodgy shit with it. You know, which, you know, fair enough. His parents claimed his body right away because they were worried about body snatchers, grave robbers and all that kind of thing and that somebody would do something dodgy with his body, which, you know, after what he did. Fair enough. Fair enough. And so they decided they were going to get him cremated but nobody would take the body. No one in San Francisco would accept the corpse. Because, you know, nobody wanted to be associated with the monster of the Belfry, or the demon of the Belfry, depending on which paper you bought. He was one or the other. Luckily, a Los Angeles farm managed to like accept it. And so he was cremated on January 13th, 1898. And that is the tale of the Demon of the Belfry. If you liked my retelling of this tale, feel free to rate and review five stars. I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying I'd very much like it if you would. And tell me something fun about yourself. Tell me what your favourite kind of pyjamas are. Who doesn't love pyjamas? They're the best. Uh, You can follow me on all of the socials. If you message me on Instagram or you tweet me on Twitter, I will respond. I will message back. Because I'm I'm a sucker for attention. I can't help it. That's just who I am. And before I go, can I just tell everyone to go watch Do Revenge on Netflix? It is like a love letter to 
I don't know what I would call modern classic cinema with chick flicks and things like that, romantic comedies, sort of defining movies of genres in the 80s, 90s and noughties. It's, mmm, I love it so much. Like, I'm, I'm gonna rewatch it. Like, I usually watch something once and then I'm done. But there are some things I will watch several hundred times because that's who I am as a person. That being said, I'm gonna say farewell to y'all. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.